Make small games. If you've ever looked up how to start making video games, it's the one piece of advice that shows up again and again, and that's for good reason. Small games get finished. Today, I want to talk about why making small games, especially in something like Pico 8, might just be the perfect way to start making video games. So, first of all, why should you make small games? Put simply, making small games teaches you what making big games doesn't. That being, how to scope, how to polish, and most importantly, how to finish a game. Let's start with the big one, scope. Most beginner projects fail for the simple reason that they try to do way too much. Big ideas are exciting, but without experience, it's easy to underestimate just how long things take to make. If you set out to build an epic open-world RPG with branching storylines, dynamic weather systems, and a huge skill tree, chances are you'll likely burn out before you finish the first questline. This is an issue that can be circumvented by making small games, as they force you to focus on the important features only, and in doing so will allow you to determine what features are essential to the core gameplay loop, and what features are just distractions. Once you've finished a few small games, you'll start to understand how long different features take to implement, which in turn makes planning any future game projects far more realistic, and drastically improves the odds that your next project won't end up in the unfinished folder. Another benefit of making small games is how quickly you can actually start playing them. With a smaller scope, you can go from an idea to a playable prototype in a matter of days, or maybe even a few hours. And the sooner you have something playable, the sooner you can start showing it to people. Watching someone else play your game is incredibly valuable. It can help you deduce what actually works and what really doesn't. Maybe your controls aren't as intuitive as you thought, or maybe the mechanic you've built your whole game around just isn't really that fun to play around with in its current state. Well, that's okay. With a small game, you can quickly fix those issues. It's better to find out your game is confusing after a few days of development rather than a few months. Joe from the Indie Game Clinic YouTube channel talks about the importance of effective prototyping and early playtesting a lot in his content, having come across numerous games that look really good, but the core gameplay still needs work. And by that point, when you have a lot of finalised assets and mechanics, it's much harder to make these necessary changes. Small games help to avoid this pitfall. Instead of spending months working on untested mechanics, you put yourself in a position to get player feedback early and use it to iterate on your gameplay. We've already talked about keeping your scope small, but we can actually take this a step further. Taking a design by constraint approach to game development is a fantastic way to breed creativity. This approach involves intentionally limiting the tools you can use or your game scope to force yourself to come up with creative solutions to some of the problems that you might face during development. For example, if you're not confident in your skills as an artist, you might limit yourself to making a pixel art game with only a handful of colours. Or if you're not confident in your programming skills, you might design a game that uses only a single core mechanic rather than juggling multiple half-finished systems. When you can't rely on flashy graphics or endless features, your core gameplay loop has to carry the entire game, and having a solid primary gameplay loop is arguably the most important aspect when it comes to making good games. Some of the most iconic indie games started out this way being made under strict time constraints in game jams or by deeply exploring a single game mechanic. A great example of this is the original version of Celeste. It was made over the course of four days in Pico 8 for a game jam, and features as a playable easter egg in the Steam version of the game. This classic Pico 8 version consists of 30 levels, and its gameplay is focused entirely around one idea, tight, responsive platforming with the ability to dash in the air. However, because it was made with clear limitations, such as the tiny resolution and just four days to finish the project, the developers push that one mechanic to its absolute limit. If there's one thing to bear in mind from this example, it's that more features does not always equate to better gameplay. Okay, so we've talked about scoping our project properly, prototyping quickly, and embracing limitations. Now it's time to talk about polish. Polish, or game juice, is what makes a game feel finished. It's all of the little details, like smooth animations and satisfying sound effects, or tight controls and juicy particle effects. The kind of things that make pressing a button or landing a hit feel really satisfying. However, implementing all of those details takes time, and if you're busy wrangling with a massive, overscoped game, you might not have that time available to polish every feature that you add. Conversely, with a smaller game, you'll have time to focus on and implement all of these little details. And while polish might just seem like the icing on the cake, it can actually be the difference between a game that feels clunky and unresponsive, and a game that feels great to play. At the end of the day, players won't care how big your game is if it feels boring to play. A shorter, polished experience will always leave a stronger impression than a longer, unpolished one. 
So rather than spending your time building more levels or adding more features, it can often be worthwhile to just make what you already have a little bit better. And finally, and maybe most importantly, making small games teaches you how to finish games. Finishing a game will see you taking a messy prototype, iterating on it through playtesting, polishing it up with all those juicy little details, and then releasing it. The whole process, starting from an idea to releasing a highly polished game, is a skill in itself, and it's something you won't get to practice if you're stuck working on the same, ever sprawling game for years on end. So, that just about covers why Make Small Games is the one piece of advice that shows up almost every time you look up how to start making your own video games. However, despite how simple it may seem, from personal experience, actually making a small game can be harder than it initially sounds. The problem is that unless you stay disciplined about sticking to the limitations you set for your game, it's incredibly easy for things to spiral. There's a reason that there's so much content out there covering how Scope Creep has claimed yet another project. Even self-imposed constraints like a minimal colour palette or a single game mechanic can start to slip if you're not careful. Why not just add one more game mechanic? Why not just add in a few extra colours? Before you know it, your small game might not be so small anymore. And this is where I think Pico 8 really comes into fruition. If you don't know about it already, Pico 8 is a fantasy console. You can think of it like a virtual retro gaming system. It's a tiny, self-contained environment built specifically for making, sharing, and playing retro-style games, and it's incredibly well-tailored for making small games as it comes with its own built-in constraints. It gives you a fixed 128 by 128 resolution, a 16 color palette, four sound channels, and a hard limit on how much code you can write. It's practically built for a design by constraint approach to game development. One of my favorite things about Pico 8 is that it's a self-contained game development environment. It has its own code editor, sprite and map editor, and tools for making sound effects and music. So there's no hopping between different programs, exporting and importing assets, or dealing with a bunch of different file formats. You can just tweak everything in Pico 8 itself. It makes prototyping fast, and because of its built-in limitations, it naturally teaches you how to scope effectively. The code limit alone forces you to think carefully about what features really need to be in your game. Additionally, the low resolution and limited colour palette of the system takes the focus away from flashy graphics and instead places it on good gameplay. This is a point I particularly want to talk about, as this was one pitfall that I fell into when I first started game development. There are a lot of incredibly beautiful games being released these days, however, good graphics is not a substitute for good gameplay. Unfortunately, I learned this lesson the hard way with my very first 3D game, Penguins. Penguins was one of my earliest game projects. It was a 3D game that I started making in the Godot game engine. At its core, it was a simple penguin sumo game where you had to push the other players off of the map, and it played like a mini-game from the Mario Party series. Looking back on it now, I'd say it still looks pretty charming with its low poly stylized aesthetic, but unfortunately, its good looks are where the positives with this game end. From a game design perspective, it just wasn't a great game. The movement was incredibly slippery, which was controllable once you'd gotten used to it, but resulted in first-time players immediately flying off of the map, which meant that the majority of their first impression with the game was just watching the bots play. I also had a mechanic where you could dash to knock the other players off the map, and I ended up giving each player two dashes that have independent two-second recharge times. Not that you'd ever know this, because there's absolutely no indication of how many dashes you have, or when they're fully recharged. The reason for this was that I couldn't decide on an aesthetically pleasing way to show this information in the game, because I was so hyper-focused on keeping the game looking good. But hey, who needs good gameplay when you've got a lovely looking character select screen, right? Yeah, I never finished that project. Or the idea I had later for an atmospheric narrative-driven platformer either, if you can believe it. After giving up on both of those projects, I took a long break from game development. However, it was a couple of years later I happened to stumble across a video on Pico 8. I started making small games with it shortly after, and to my surprise, I ended up finishing four games within a single year. Those being a couple of arcade-style high-score games, a short, narrative-driven game, and an asymmetrical turn-based strategy game. So, if you're just starting out with game development, or if you haven't released a game yet, why not give it a try? If you want to get started making your own small games with Pico 8, I'd highly recommend checking out the Lazy Dev Academy YouTube channel, run by Christian. He has some truly fantastic video series available covering how to make a variety of games in Pico 8 from start to finish. So whether you're using Pico 8, or Unity, or Godot, the one takeaway from this video should be that finishing small games is the fastest way to start making good games. And if you've made it this far, please consider liking the video and subscribing to my channel for future updates. Thanks for watching.